so today we're delighted to have Pia Arrhenius here today to talk to share her thoughts. Pia is a labor economist working on regional economic growth and demographic change. She manages the regional and microeconomics group in the Dallas Federal Research Department, is executive editor of the quarterly publication Southwest Economy, and co-edited 10-Gallon Economy, Sizing Up Economic Growth in Texas. Her academic research focuses on the labor market, impacts of immigration, unauthorized immigration, and U.S. immigration policy. Nothing going on in the last few years for you. Just really, boring. really boring and quiet. Uh, she's co-author of the book, Beside the Golden Door, U.S. Immigration Reform in a New Era of Globalization. She's affiliated with several academic institutions. She's a research fellow at the Tower Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist University and at the IZA Institute of Labor in Bonn, Germany, as well as adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. She's also adjunct professor at Baylor University, the Dallas campus, where she teaches in the Executive MBA program. She was senior economist of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Ex Executive Office of the President, Washington, D.C. in 2004 and 5, where she was an advisor to the Bush administration on labor, health, and immigration issues. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Los Angeles and bachelor degrees in economics and Spanish from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So with that, please join me in welcoming Peter to the stage. Great, good morning. Uh, let me see if I can get myself started. Uh, great to see so many of you out this morning. I'm glad to welcome you with some good news in terms of the annual outlook, really, for 2020. I think uh, we have, I put here, outlook brightening. I mean, I think we've had a solid year in 2019. Um, and we do see some stabilization of some of the headwinds, so we do, uh, we, we have a pretty positive outlook at the moment. Let me give you a roadmap um, so as you know sort of where we're going. Uh, the regional economy was really healthy overall in, in 2019. Um, Texas job growth was close to its trend. Trend is usually 2.1% two, two, 2 growth, which is significantly above, above the U.S. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we saw is tight labor markets, of course, which are both good and bad. They're good for wage growth. We like that. Uh, it's hard for hiring for, for firms. Uh, but certainly has uh, bolstered the consumer, as I'll show you uh, when I show you the GDP numbers. The other thing we saw into Texas was we had a little bit of a lull in migration into the state, and so we saw migration pick up. We just got the census data uh, that shows interstate migration and international migration, um, so I'll show you uh, those data as well. The importance of the migration really is that the only way to sustain this premium on job growth relative to the nation is to attract workers from the rest of the nation and from other countries. So it really is a key piece of the reason why uh, we can grow faster. So as I mentioned, headwinds, uh, we see them, the headwinds that were affecting us in 2019 are either stable or dissipating slightly as we enter 2020. So that's the good news. Um, so labor markets are tight, but they're stable. Um, we worry about labor markets because, as I mentioned, they suppress job growth because labor shortages certainly cause uh, difficulties hiring for employers. Um, it, we saw in 2019 investment was significantly suppressed. Uh, but some of that is probably due to uncertainty around the outlook, certainly uncertainty around tariffs and trade policy, and we've seen some of that alleviated in recent, uh, maybe over the last month or so. And so we're seeing this also as a headwind uh, to investment and growth that should be uh, dissipating slightly as we move into, um, although now there's this uh, trade issues with Europe. So I think we're in a situation where as soon as one situation seems a little bit resolved or at least stabilized, then one another is created <laughs> somehow. Uh, the energy sector was weak in 2019. So we see there not a huge improvement, but certainly a slowing in the pace of decline. Uh, and that uh, was, means that the energy sector is going to be less of a drag in 2020 which is extremely important for Texas, obviously, and for Houston. Um, global growth is slower. Uh, it slowed last year, and certainly Mexico is uh, not doing well. Uh, but we, again, here we see some stabilization and some positive uh, signs uh, emerging. All right, with that, let me, I'll sort of go national economy, state economy, and Houston, and then, uh, and I'll be sort of, uh, snappy about it because we have two great speakers coming after me. So I know you're going to get lots of good stuff this morning. 
So what did I want to say about the national economy? Really just two things. This is U.S. monthly job growth, kind of a busy chart, but the point of the chart really is that those blue bars are above those dashed green lines. That just means we're still growing jobs at a pace which is not sustainable. Actually, we're above uh, sort of where we need to be to keep the unemployment rate stable. So, uh, you know, even if you see a little bit of slowing in job growth, that's fine because given the outlook for workforce growth in the U.S., uh, you know, in, in this phase that we're in with very much slower workforce growth than we've had in the past, we really can only sustain about 120,000 jobs per month in terms of job creation. So if we're growing 145 or 200,000, I mean, that's uh, definitely going to draw down on the unemployment rate. Um, so we're in, a, we're in good shape on, on job growth nationally. Uh, on the GDP data, here I'm showing you, you can see on the left in the blue bar, actual GDP growth for the U.S. in the third quarter, and then you have the projection in red uh, next to the blue bar. And then uh, on the other side of the dashed black line, you have the contributions to GDP growth by component. So what's important here, so we're growing 2.1% in the third quarter overall. Uh, that's good growth for us, given where we are. Again, we're in sort of we're not where we were 20 years ago. We're not going to grow 3%. We can't. Uh, but uh, so 2.1% is pretty good performance. What's concerning about the chart is that if you look at PCE, that's consumption expenditures. So really all of this growth is driven by the consumer. So solid consumer. Our big concern is where it says the next set of bars, non-residential fixed investment are in negative territory both for the third quarter and the projection for the fourth quarter. And if I showed you the first half of 2019, you would also see negative investment in terms of being a drag on GDP growth. That's really been our concern all year. Uh, when we uh, think about recession, we think, uh, which we're not doing right now, obviously, looks like the economy has good momentum and so forth. But if, you know, uh, about six months ago, our big concern was if we turned into recession, it would be an investment-led recession, not a consumer-led recession, because the consumer is doing quite well. Okay? All right. Turning to the Texas economy, I always start with the Federal Reserve District map. There's 12 Federal Reserve Districts. And I do this only as an excuse to show you the next chart. So, of course, we're the 11th Federal Reserve District here, which is Texas, and uh, the best parts of Louisiana and New Mexico. <laughs> They are the best in terms of economic growth. <laughs> All right, so, so that, that map is an excuse to show you this, which is job growth for by Federal Reserve District. And of course, we're the red line, which is on top, a big gap with the rest of the country. Um, so just to remind you, as we start this new year, we're lucky to be where we are. We're lucky to be in Texas and in the 11th Federal Reserve District. This shows that when we went into the, uh, into the Great Recession, our recession here in our district was, slower, was shorter than in the rest of the nation, and we came out sooner, obviously. Um, the fracking boom was a big piece of that. There were a couple years there where Texas really was the only large state in the nation that was creating jobs. Um, and so there's been bumps along the way, certainly the oil bust here in Houston in 2015 and 2016. Uh, but in general, the trajectory for our region is very positive. Um, this is another picture of just also job growth, just to sort of highlight the last year. I circled the last two bars just to show you. So 2019, as far as uh, we get new data tomorrow, uh, but through most of 2019, we grew 2% uh, for the year compared to 1.4% for the nation. Uh, tight labor markets, goodness, the unemployment rate is at a record low, 3.4% in Texas, 3.5% in the U.S., uh, it's just uh, unheard of in terms of uh, what we've seen really uh, going back as long as the statistics have been kept. So very, very tight labor markets. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier the importance of migration. Again, the only reason we can grow jobs as fast as we do is because we're bringing workers from the rest of the, of the country and also from other countries. So here I'm just showing you net, mi net in migration, so this inflows minus outflows into Texas, going back to 2000, I've divided those bars into domestic and international. And so domestic is, um, is in blue, uh, and international is, is in gray. So you can see that there was a little bit of a pickup in, in 2019, uh, so in domestic migration, but actually uh, uh, not, not as much international migration. So that's something we want to watch going forward. 
Uh, domestic migration we bring in mostly from other large states like California and Illinois and New York um, send uh, people to Texas. The interesting thing is you can look in the household survey and see why people are moving to Texas uh, and you can compare to the rest of the, of the United States and so we looked at that. Relocating for job, 51% of those who came to Texas from another state were relocating for a job and that was 10 percentage points higher than in the rest of the nation. Uh, so that's great, they're coming here for work. Like, they moved to Florida to retire, they come here to work, so that's important. Uh, uh, that's an important difference, because we're always toe-to-toe -to -toe with Florida in terms of top migrants, top destination. Uh, but then amenities, they don't come here for the amenities, so <laughs> they're not coming for the mountains in Dallas or the beaches, I guess. So, go figure. In, if you look by industry, uh, it's, it's instructive to look 2019 job growth by industry. Here I've sort of circled, sort of very broad-based, very, very robust growth in construction, financial activities, even in manufacturing, education and health services, really broad-based growth across industries, uh, with the exception of oil and gas. Oil and gas uh, sector was really the only sector that uh, saw job losses last year. And of course, that's going to impact Houston, as we'll see. I'll get to that here in a minute. What happened with energy activity? Well, as you know, the oil prices turned down late in 2018. And then I'm showing you oil prices here in blue. And then, of course, a few months after oil prices turned down, the rig count turns down. Um, so we've seen the rig count sort of uh, decline throughout 2019. Uh, you can't really see at the end, but we actually have a few weeks now of stabilized rig counts, so it's actually turned up by a few. Um, so we're hoping that means the rig count is stabilizing, um, and that, again, energy will be less of a drag uh, on growth in our region in 2020. The interesting thing we also saw in 2019, actually, was um, here I'm showing you well completions in red. So as the rig count was going down, though, for a while in 2019, well completions were going up. So these are wells that are already drilled but not producing. So as the oil price stabilized in the beginning of 2019, you know, EMP companies went in and, and finished those, those, uh, those ducts, those drilled but uncompleted wells. So, so we didn't really see much impact on oil production uh, because even though the rig count was going down, well completions were going up. Of course, they turned down at the very end of the year, but I just think it's interesting now that we have all these decks that we can see these sort of dynamics in the energy industry. And so before we used to just look at the rig count, and now we can sort of look at the rig count and look at well completions, and there's, there's lots of metrics uh, for, for activity in the, in the oil field. The Dallas Fed has uh, probably, arguably, the best energy survey in the nation. We have over 160 firms responding quarterly to our energy survey, and here I'm showing you the results, and I've sort of circled uh, the most recent results. And um, so this is EMP companies and oil field services companies, and so business activity is still in negative territory. So this is a diffusion index, which means that, so in Q4, business activity was still sort of going down, capital expenditures were flat, employment was declining. Um, but what was significant is that company outlook barely, you know, turned positive, barely positive, but, um, but that's sort of also another reason that we're saying we're hoping energy will be less of a drag in 2020. Um, one of the, one of the uh, side effects of, of, the, of the oil and gas boom and the energy boom, both upstream and downstream, of course, has been incredible growth in exports. Here I'm plotting Texas exports in blue and comparing to the nation in gray, and it's just absolutely phenomenal, uh, the growth in exports. And this despite, if you look over the last year, despite the tariffs, uh, despite the very expensive dollar, uh, that you know, our exports have just really outperformed, and so much of that is obviously coming out, coming through Houston, and going out through the port of Houston, and really all the Gulf Coast ports. Um, but here you can see, of course, in the latest data, it, the incredible impact that removing the the ban on crude oil exports had a tremendous impact. You can just this this latest uh, very steep uh, increase in exports is due to the removal of the crude oil export ban, which was actually. I always like to highlight that because it's actually one time Congress did something right. So that's important. Now let's see what they can achieve if they do the right thing. That's amazing. Uh, so, so very important. 
Um, we have asked our, we have a lot of, uh, we run these surveys, uh, and we also welcome you to sign up for our surveys. There's actually on the comment card, there's a bottom spot there for you to, uh, to volunteer to be part of our surveys. Uh, but so what I'm showing you now, these pie charts is surveys uh, from businesses in Texas, over 600 firms are responding and they're telling us, we're asking them, how are you impacted by tariffs? And in the latest round of questioning, uh, in, in December, 43% of respondents said that they were negatively impacted by, by tariffs. And, uh, and po in terms of, po there was essentially no positive, nobody that reported being positively impacted by tariffs. In the long run, uh, if you look on the right, you can see on the pie chart that there's a little bit more, uh, about 10% are saying in the long run they would be positively impacted by tariffs, but again, 37% are saying no. So what's significant about this is Texas is the number one exporting state in the nation. We lead uh, all the other states and we lead even California uh, by uh, tens of billions of dollars in terms of annual exports. And so we are exposed to trade policy here in our region. Um, and so what happens on trade policy is very significant. It's very significant for us that USMCA uh, is in the process of being ratified, the, the new NAFTA. Um, so although it's you know, uh, has more trade restrictions in it than the old NAFTA, it's still positive in the sense that it's resolved some uncertainty around a North American trade zone. I did want to say uh, one really bright spot in 2019 was residential construction in Texas. Here's multifamily permits, that's apartment permits. Um, it just, um, you know, uh, spiked upward in 2019. I think certainly the lower interest rates helped uh, with some of that. Um, but we also even saw single family permits turn up. That's the red line. And that's a very significant development because we haven't had as much growth in single family as we have in apartment markets. Um, and so uh, it really has been, if you look since the Great Recession, as this chart does, it really has been apartment recovery, not really a single family house recovery. Um, and that trend continues, interestingly enough. Let me jump ahead here because Dan is. Uh, showing me cards saying I'm out of time. Uh, so, uh, so let's see. Uh, one of the reasons we have a little bit of a brighter outlook is that from our Texas Business Outlook indexes, uh, we see at the end here that company outlook um, is turned up at the end of the year. So that's positive. So we're getting positive signals from our contacts. Um, one of the reasons is that this outlook uncertainty index has really uh, gone down. Uh, it really went down sharply in, in uh, November and December. So that's another really important uh, uh, improvement. Just very briefly in Houston, I just wanted to show you in terms of job growth along uh, comparing across Texas metros, one pattern that you see in 2019 is really that the energy hubs are the slower growing metros in Texas. So. Uh, so Houston came in at 1.6%, which is a little bit below their trend growth. And so again, obviously the energy sector is weighing on this region in particular. Um, Austin is always the star performer, always off the charts. Um, <clears throat> but other energy hubs like Corpus Christi and Midland Odessa, obviously, um, very slow. We're very slow in 2019. Um, let's see. I know I have to finish here. So. Uh, I did want to say, also, if you look at the Houston region, if you look at a little bit longer perspective, I hear I, when I was looking at long-run income gains, this is household median income in real terms, just comparing again across Texas metros, and you can see that Houston is a little bit below the Texas average and a little bit below the, U the U.S. average. And I think if you look back 10 years, it really has a lot to do with the oil bust. Uh, which took some, uh, some wind out of the uh, momentum here in, in, in this particular region. Again, Austin is always at the top of all of our charts, and it's at the top of the income gains chart as well. The nice thing, though, is that, well, rent growth was also slower in Houston over these last uh, 10 years. So you want, you know, if you have slower income growth, you don't want the cost of living to go up. Um, so as long as those are, it's still, rents are still going up, but, but not as much as they are in, in some of these other places. So that, that's important. All right, um, let me turn to the outlook. So very solid outlook then for Texas and for, for Houston in 2020. Um, Texas employment gains, again, are healthy and mostly broad-based. The 2019 headwinds are stabilizing. Uh, construction and housing remain bright spots, and we expect that to, to continue. 
this year-end improvement that I've talked a little bit about uh, means slightly higher growth in 2020. So with uncertainty down, company outlooks up. Really, our forecast for 2020 Texas job growth is a little bit above 2%. We came in at 2% in 2019. We're looking to come in uh, about 2.2% uh, in, in 2020. Um, for the Houston area, we're looking at between 1.8 and 2%. So we're also looking for a little bit of firming uh, in Houston as well uh, in 2020. What are we watching in the short run? Uh, labor constraints, certainly from tight labor markets. Uh, policy uncertainty, whether it's going to be trade policy, political uncertainty, um, global growth, and of course, oil prices. For us, is the perennial focus. Um, and what to watch in the long run? I didn't really have a chance to talk about this sort of the decline in immigration that we're seeing into our region. We may be seeing that, seeing that nationally as well. So I think that's also, that's going to be an issue going forward because we're moving into these two decades when the baby boomers are retiring. We have very slow workforce growth among, uh, among uh, domestic workforce. And so complementing that with immigration has actually been key. Uh, the business climate, of course, in our region has been a real strength. And so looking, looking toward that. And then climate change. Climate change is huge. And we're very vulnerable in Texas, very vulnerable in Houston uh, to climate change. Uh, and policies around climate change, really, things like carbon taxes and other, or shutting down fracking, or you know, some of these ideas that you hear floating around policymakers, those, we're very vulnerable to those types of changes. And so you know, we, need to, we need to watch that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Pia. And just to tie together a couple of themes she's done at the end, uh, one of the things I mentioned that the way that we're working on the MBA program, a, a national trend in the U.S. is a dramatic decline in international applications to come get an MBA in the United States. Um, and so a lot of the tailwinds that MBA programs are facing have come from the lack of international demand. Our applications have probably fallen 30 percent from the international side over the last couple of years. Um, what we've done is adjust and taken more domestic students. We've got great domestic demand. So we've gone from about a 30% international MBA program to about a 22% international MBA program. Uh, but it's part of this long run problem If those people don't come here for graduate school, that ta those talented people are less likely to stay um, and join our workforce. So that's one of the long run issues that, that we're worried about as, as higher education institutions and business schools. Um, so John's already standing. I'm going to introduce John Butler. Um, and John and I went to grad school together. I will follow the script and will not tell you all the really good stuff. Um, but uh, John has a very, very long signature block. If you uh, get an email from him, you can see all, all of his titles. He's a clinical associate professor of finance. He's the ac academic director of the McCombs Energy Initiative, the academic director of the K. Billy Hutchison Center for Energy Law and Business, the director of the Masters of Science and Finance, and the director of the Undergraduate Energy Management Program. I read all that, and I think he's going to ask for, for, for more money. Um, he earned his PhD in, in management science and information systems at the University of Texas at Austin. That's when we were in, in school together. Uh, then he cleaned up his resume because his bachelor's degree was from Texas A&M University. Um, his research involves the use of decision science models to support decision making with a particular emphasis on decision and risk analysis models with multiple performance criteria. He's consulted with a number of organizations regarding the application of decision analysis tools to a variety of practical problems, including management of natural gas storage facilities, disposition of surplus weapons grade, grade plutonium, and valuation of gas and oil properties. We were in grad school, and I was working on how you pay executives, and he was figuring out what to do with plutonium. Um, I, I felt at a disadvantage then, and I still do today. Um, so then, please welcome my, my good friend and colleague, John Butler, to the stage. All right, thanks, Jay. Um, I grew up in southwest Houston. My dad was a geology professor at U of H, and so in some ways I'm kind of in the family business, but as Jay pointed out, my PhD is in decision making. And so like Carlos, what I'm thinking about is trying to get my students to think about trade-offs. So when I present this, when I think about energy, I want it to be reliable, cheap, and clean. And unfortunately, it's hard to get all three at once. We've got to make trade-offs. And that, I think, is what we're trying to do with a lot of our training is to get students to at least admit that that's going to be something we have to think about, right? Nothing is free, no matter what some of our politicians might tell us. Um, when you look here, this is one of my favorite graphs. What it basically says is, as people consume more energy, and this is a log scale, so it's like a Richter scale for an earthquake, there's factors of 10 there, 
But as we consume more energy, people are generally happier. This is the UN 2014 Human Development Index, happier and better off. And I would argue this is causal. This is not just correlation. Having functioning hospitals, refrigeration for food, and cars make people better off, right? And so we're up here. We're doing pretty well. What's interesting is, can China and India move up this chart without consuming more energy? That, to me, is really the issue that we face globally, right, when we start to think about this problem. Another way to see it is this. Again, a log seal down at the bottom. It turns out as people earn more money, they buy more cars, right? So we're up here. We're the United States. This is our bubble. This is our uh, sort of average income GDP per capita. Excuse me. We have about 800 cars per 1,000 people. Here's China. The stat that I heard the other day is in 2030, the U.S. will have, or sorry, the developed economy, OECD countries have a billion people in the middle class, China will have a billion, India will have a billion. Will they, as they get richer, stay down here? Are they going to want cars? Right? I mean, this is, a, this is what we face. We've got to start making these trade-offs. This is a little bit of an eye test, right? But let me just, this is a Sankey diagram. So let me explain it to you. The U.S. consumes about 100 units of energy. So that's, we'll just call it that. So what we have down here is about, what is that? 36% of the energy we consume comes from petroleum. About, uh, for Eric from our Chenier friends, about 31% is natural gas. And here's about 1% from solar. These are all the sources of energy. Here's what we do with it. We have transportation systems, industrial systems, commercial systems, residential systems. And a lot of that is fed by electricity. So one of the reasons we wanted our friends from NCAP here, they're looking up here. They're thinking about all the things that generate electricity, coal, geothermal, wind, hydro, nuclear. Here's this electrification we're talking about for electrifying the economy, and then where does it go? You'll notice there's this little line that I'm going to visit later down to transportation. Those are our Tesla friends, right, that are using electricity to drive cars. The other things I want you to notice are this. We're losing two-thirds of the energy from heat and other byproducts of producing it. And this is why it's so important to think about energy efficiency and conserving some of the energy. A hundred come in, we're kind of using a third of it. Two-thirds of it gets wasted. The last thing to see is notice our special friend, natural gas. Natural gas can do everything, right? It goes into electricity. It goes into residential. We're doing commercial things. Industrial, there are even some natural gas cars if you go to the Chesapeake parking lot, right? They've got the cars on site. The problem is this. If natural gas and oil traded on their energy equivalents, right, $2 gas, six times or one-sixth the energy of oil, oil should be 12. Pretty sure oil's not 12, right? It's low, but it's not 12. The problem is these are not perfect substitutes. We can't just say all units of energy created equal. Some are where we want them. Some do things that we want to do with them. So when we think about changing this system, we've got to be very careful. Uh, what's good news, though, is that the world has gotten a little more efficient. This is our energy consumed. This is our GDP. And we've been able to increase GDP, and starting in about the 70s, do it more efficiently with energy. We're using it better. That's one of the main things that Exxon is forecasting will be an energy source, is this ability to conserve energy. Uh, Sean liked this picture because, as he pointed out, it looks like the energy business is pretty young. Right? If you go back, we started burning wood. This is our first geoengineering project. And it, we kept burning wood. And this is what my undergrads doing. She's like, what? what's up with the wood? <laughs> right? I mean, why didn't we get rid of it? And then we started using coal, and coal hasn't gone away. And then we started using oil and natural gas. Nothing goes away. The infrastructure and energy is long-term investments. It's sticky. Right? So it's hard to turn things on and off. I like this picture. It's a little fuzzy. But this is just the US again. And if you go back to 1850, again, here's all this wood that we were burning. And you can see we keep using less and less wood. But even in the U.S., we're still using some. You know, here we, had, we, were, burning, we were using whales for kerosene. Oil comes in and saves the whales after it puts off the, hydro, after the, the coal. Right? We end up with gas. We end up with nuclear. And what's interesting, there's two things here. We've been naturally decarbonizing. Right? I mean, all this energy is really just carbon and hydrogen bonds. And what you want to do is break those bonds, harvest the energy with as little carbon as possible. And so wood has very high levels of carbon poor, uh, per carb carbon hydrogen bond. There's one in a molecule. Versus natural gas, there's one carbon and there's four bonds. So we're getting a bigger bang for our buck as we've moved through this cycle. 
We're naturally decarbonizing just based on demand. The other thing I want to point out is um, we have a good colleague um, at, McC at UT who uh, was Tillerson's personal advisor at Exxon, and he and I sat down with this chart, and that's kind of where China and India are today. So here's the United States in 2010. This was their forecast for 2020. It's not that far off. Here's China and India today. Can they leapfrog us and get to here? Right? I mean, they may speed it up. We've seen countries go from not having telephones right to mobile phones because they're able to do these technology leaps, but can they move 60 years ahead quickly? Right? That's going to be our challenge. This is an Exxon slide, but I should just point out, this is not Exxon data. They're just harvesting the data from these 14 models. There's a group called the Energy uh, Modeling Forum at Stanford. And the reason I'm showing you this slide is this is their forecast for 2040, assuming we try to hit a two-degree carbon scenario. And all I want to draw your attention to are two things. Red plus green is hydrocarbons, right? Notice, no matter whose model you use, 200 right out of about 400, you're at 50, 60% hydrocarbons. We're not going to stop using them very quickly. The other thing that's important are all these little CCSs. For this to work, we're going to really probably have to get much better at capturing the carbon and either sequestering it or, the new term is CCUS, using it. Right? We need to create a carbon economy if a lot of these things are going, to, are going to work well. Right? That's a lot of gas with CCS. I don't have to tell you guys in the room, uh, this was a nice slide to see. I'm surprised that my students don't appreciate this idea of being energy independent, but they don't remember waiting in line for gas. They don't really remember Enron or even the financial crisis. So we shouldn't be surprised. But this is a big deal. Right? This is a big deal. And what this leads to is cars. Right? So, <laughs> This sort of started my fascination with understanding the economy from cars. So this is a guy, I know it's a guy because my friend took the picture and drove by, with his Frackett license plate, right? So that's good. If it's you, I apologize, right? I'm always a little nervous. They don't mean to be in the wrong room. Uh, oh, sorry, Eric. I, I apologize. Chenier did not format this. I did that poorly. So um, my apologies. But what I want to show you here is uh, this is sort of our energy supply stack in a different picture. This is our total demand. Right, and there's EIA engineer data going out to 2050. Gosh, it kind of looks like we're going to have more than we need. Right, this is the export story that we're talking about, right? The U.S. will be net energy independent. The other thing I want to remind you is that humans like cars, but they're also really not very good forecasters. So if you look here, this was the 2010 EIA reference case forecast. Not the low case, the reference case. There's actual. We missed it. Right, we missed it. He didn't, but we missed it, right? <laughs> So that's a problem. Now, it turns out we're good at this, but markets work, Jay. You'll be happy to know. When our undergrads looked at natural gas in 2013 and said, well, look, India has gas for 13. I can get it at Lake Charles for about $3. Hmm. Arbitrage, right? Well, look what happens in India. 2013, 13 bucks. 950, 441. It's working. We're going to converge to kind of a global price as we're able to move this gas around. We're not the only ones with these shale resources. This is a busy eye chart, but the dark stuff is where we know the shale is. That's the one we want, right? The vodka muerta down there would be nice, right? But that, there's political issues, of course, that prevent that. And then just by luck, this slide also has some other things in it. All this pink stuff are areas where we don't have a lot of water. You know what we need to do to frack wells, right? We need water. So anytime those two colors overlap, that's going to be a little tension. You look up here in China in particular, sorry, China in particular, we've got some issues. Right? Those are future things we're going to have to solve. I'm going to shift to this a little bit and talk more about what the folks are doing at NCAP, which isn't just electricity, I know, Sean, but uh, that's kind of part of it. Here's the current mix of electricity in the United States, about 34% natural gas, 28 coal, a little nuke. This is what we're forecasting for 2040. We're not going to, we'll retire some nuclear plants. Some of this is demand. But look what's happening to gas, renewables, and then here's our friend coal. And as Sean reminded me, they're just putting money to work. They're trying to find a good place to put it. And for every 1% drop in coal or nuclear over here is $21 billion of investment. Right? So I know you guys have money to put to work. This may be a place to look. That's what we brought Sean for. The nice thing is also this stuff has become more economic. So as I said, my father was an energy professor, and, or sorry, a geology professor, and we went to Colorado in the 70s and I saw a solar array. And my father made this pithy comment I didn't appreciate, which was solar has been the energy of the, of the energy, solar has been the energy of the next five years for the last 20 years, right? We've been sort of talking about this problem. It's happening. It's starting to fall to where 
this level, oh sorry, this levelized cost, right here your conventional or thermals is dropping. It's becoming economic. It's closer to grid parity. We'll ask Sean about subsidies and things later, but it's moving in that direction. Now all this electricity has led to some other good license plates, right? The pithy what's up for a Tesla, you have gas, right? <laughs> uh, CO2 free. Note the Arizona license plate, note the Arizona energy mix. <laughs> Ignoring the petroleum products in the wheels, the tires, the seats, the plastic, look at the fuel. Oh, coal, natural gas. That's all right. It's fine. This is partly why I'm trying to educate my students, and some of them aren't quite as nice. RIP oil. I know, it's sad. Now in Houston, this is the one Gail was mad at, this is Louisiana Avenue, and I was running down the street trying to catch this guy, that's why it's fuzzy. He has a coal-powered Tesla, right? At least he's a little more honest. And then this person is powered by coal and paid for by you, which is also good, right? So again, uh, th these cars tell us a lot, and then the final Texas answer is this person. So this is South Austin. Uh, that is a 500 horsepower Jeep, if you don't know, right? Just what every young man needs. And it, again, I'm speculating it was a young man. Uh, oil well, 13 miles per gallon, right? And so I'm trying, what I'm trying to remind you of, there are people in these systems that are making decisions. This is not just about economics. It's not just about, it's about people. Can we convince them to do things, all right? So to be a tiny bit provocative, I'm going to use a quote, which I wish I could say for sure was Sheikh Abed Zaki Yamani, but it's attributed to nobody knows. But the quote goes something like, the Stone Age did not end for a lack of stones. And the supposed end of, the, the end of this quote supposedly is, the end of the age of oil is near. And he said this in the 70s, right, attributed to it. But the interesting thing, there's a couple things about this analogy that are weird. We weren't burning stones, right? There wasn't like there was a supply shortage potentially of stones. What we got was the Bronze Age. Is there a Bronze Age in energy? Is there a way to replace all that energy that we're consuming? I can't see it in the near term, but in the long term, that's what we have to find, is the Bronze Age. What about supply? We didn't run out of rocks, right? Are, we having, are there supply issues down the road? Are there policy things we may put in place that will impose upon those supply issues? Or is it preferences? Will the world decide that it really is willing to pay, because again, nothing is free for those trade-offs? All right, so with that, I'll stop. And uh, Jay, do you, I think you're going to come up and invite the, and introduce the panel. So thank you again. Thanks a lot, John. You can see why uh, he's such a good teacher. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our uh, other two speakers who are going to join us on a panel, and we'll come up and have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, you on your, on your tables have little question cards, and so be thinking about what you'd like to hear um, our panelists discuss. Uh, we're also going to have some mics or the ability to ask questions orally if you, if you prefer that. Um, so our first panelist to join uh, Pia and John up here is Sean Cumberland. Uh, Sean is currently managing partner at NCAP Energy Transition, an investment vehicle focused on lower carbon energy investments. He was previously with Prisma Energy sitting on the board and originating several of Prisma's portfolio investments. Sean established the U.S. office and was head of North America for Quinbrook Infrastructure Partners from 2016 to 2018. During his tenure, the U.S. team originated three major portfolio companies, Scout Clean Energy, GlidePath Power Solutions, and the Gemini Solar Project in Nevada. He originated and managed the investment in Scout, which represents one of Quinbrook's largest investments. In December 2002, he co-founded Arctis Capital Group, which he co-headed until he joined Quinbrook in 2016. Arctis was an investor and advisor on several renewables and other energy infrastructure projects, both domestically and internationally. He held senior executive roles at Enron, including president of Enron Caribbean, responsible for 15 energy businesses in eight countries, and served on the boards of two regionally listed companies. He was senior managing director at El Paso Merchant Energy. He co-founded the Wing Group and Power Pacific Company, firms that developed power infrastructure investments in emerging markets. He started his career in M&A uh, in corporate securities and finance attorney in the Houston and London offices of Vincent and Elkins. Now, he holds a Juris Doctor, but most importantly, a BBA degree in accounting from the University of Texas at Austin, where he graduated with honors and highest honors, respectively. Uh, he's going to be joined on our panel by Eric Franco. Eric joined Chenier in June of 2016, where he is part of the team responsible for managing the firm's portfolio of North American pipeline transportation and storage capacity. And he develops the fundamental market view underpinning the gas supply team's long-term strategy. Prior to joining Chenier, Franco conducted natural gas and electric market analysis, as well as valuations of midstream natural gas assets for Black and Beach Management Consulting. 
He earned a BA in economics from Southwestern University and then an MBA from the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Sean and Eric and then Pia and John Butler back to the stage. All right, so uh, let's get started off with a, a bit of a big picture view on the industry. So, um, Eric, do you want to lead off and tell us what's going on in oil and gas? Sure. The main uh, story I want to tell, and John has set this up very nicely, is that when you talk about the oil and gas industry in the U.S., the future, well, the, the, you know, the past few years and the, the future for the, going forward are really going to be driven by exports. So this slide here shows just how in a surprising turn of developments over the past decade, we've seen a huge amount of growth in oil and gas production in the U.S. So um, since 2010, uh, natural gas production has grown by about 70 percent, while oil production has uh, just about doubled. So what that has done is basically locked the country into being a, a net exporter of energy for the foreseeable future. And um, so I can speak a little bit more specifically about the natural gas space. So. This is, you know, the, this is a market that's it's been very interesting, especially from Chenier's perspective, um, as the U.S. gas economy has really gone from famine to feast over the past decade, where actually, um, it just before the shale gas revolution, Chenier had completed uh, a, an, LNG, an LNG import terminal in Louisiana, but since then has, has turned that around and actually begun exporting out of Louisiana and Texas. So um, it took a few years to uh, get everything turned around, but by 2016, uh, Chenier started uh, exporting a material amount of, of LNG to the rest of the world um, from Louisiana. And since then, uh, five additional uh, LNG export terminals have entered service in the U.S. And today, uh, we're exporting, uh, U.S. LNG export terminals are demanding about 9 billion cubic feet of gas per day. That's almost 10 percent of the natural gas we're producing every day um, right now. Uh, so going forward, it's, it's really tough to see as you start to look at all the X's and O's of the supply-demand balance. Um, how we can really come up with another uh, source of demand that, that's really, that could really trump or even come up close to the same order of magnitude um, of natural gas exports, just given the amount of global demand that we're seeing and the amount of demand that will show up once you actually can finance and construct um, new liquefaction capacity, which will be concentrated in the Gulf Coast. So one thing I want to talk about is from the, the LNG front, um, for those of you who want to watch from your armchairs at home going forward, you know, 2020 could be a very big year for the industry because there are a number of, term, of, of term, potential terminals in the queue um, that have filed to uh, construct additional liquefaction capacity that are very much hoping to, su to secure long-term supply deals this year to, to reach final investment decision on their terminals. Um, and one last point I would like to make is that Chenier is very well positioned in this kind of environment, although um, it's a rather loose global natural gas uh, market at the time, right now. Um, largely because we, ha one, can build very inexpensive liquefaction capacity in the Gulf Coast. We have a lot of land to do so, and we can use all these other opportune facilities that we have in place, such as, you know, berths and tanks, um, to, um, to build some of the, the least expensive liquefaction capacity in the world. The other thing is that we have the commercial know-how to develop some, um, you know, inventive uh, commercial agreements to meet the needs of our customers as we, as we try to develop additional long-term uh, capacity and sign those long-term deals to do so. So um, in terms of you know, signing uh, inter integrated production marketing deals with producers and sharing some of our international margin um, with them to finance uh, additional liquefaction capacity to, uh, to having various products where we can actually deliver gas to customers. Okay. Thanks a lot, Eric. So, Sean, sorry, Sean, turning to you. Uh, so you're in this spot uh, at NCAP, uh, a place known for more traditional oil and gas investments. So why an energy transition fund? That's a great question. We, we get asked that all the time. Um, NCAP is a, a manager of money in the energy space, and it was set up in 1988. John, I like that chart because, you know, I started my career in 86, and whether you time stamp it back to the 1880s when the first power plant was built and coal took off, or you look in the 20s and 30s when the automobiles started to boom, we're either 25 to 30 percent of the, the entirety of the energy market, if you look at it that way, both NCAP as a fund and me as a career. Um, energy has, you know, the, the name energy transition is quite interesting because 
as far as I've seen it in my 30 plus year career, it's always been in transition. It's always kind of moving towards cheaper, cleaner, more reliable, you know, more convenient. It's, it's been a transition from the very beginning. And when we developed, when I was over at Enron, the first natural gas fired power plant, you know, we watched the demise of coal occur in the UK. And time, you know, just watching what's going on right here in the US and I was involved in looking at some of the LNG import terminals before Chenier kind of flipped, or the, or the fracking turned it around and made natural gas so cheap, and Chenier turned the industry on its head. But, you know, consistently coal was 50% of the power generation mix. And now, as the charts you've seen, coal is waning away. So just like in the UK, the same thing uh, here. But NCAP, you know, was started off investing in the upstream business. Um, and got known for that about 10 years ago. They created a second vertical to invest in midstream because they saw that as being smart investment opportunities for them. About two years ago, they were watching what was happening in the renewable space and said, this looks like an interesting area to jump into. And about nine months ago, we jumped over to do this. I've been involved in the power sector and I've, I've built coal plants in China and I've built wind plants in Nicaragua, uh, wind plants in Texas. But we've watched over the last decade as renewable prices have, have plummeted, really. You know, it's gone from, from about, a, about an 80% to 70% drop in the cost of wind and solar over the last decade. And we're watching the decline in battery space that's accommodating that same thing. So it's now being competitive against thermal power plants. Um, and it looks like a really smart investment opportunity. So they decided to create a a third vertical, there's going to be a huge amount of capital that's required as you move in the transition uh, for adding this uh, new renewables in the U.S. So it looked like to be a place to, to be deploying capital. So one of the, I was thinking about John's slides and he um, talked, had all the, I liked all the Tesla license plates, John. Um, I remember talking to one of my friends who's a real estate developer in Austin, talking about his Tesla and the tax benefits he was getting. And I thought maybe that was not really what we had in mind, uh, was trying to subsidize real estate developers to drive Teslas. Um, so my, my, my question is, Sean, you know, as these, you look at these investments, is this a subsidy story? Are the there, are there returns absent uh, policy issues, or is this a policy-driven investment thesis? Well, um, you know, a number of us in the industry, all of my partners, we abhor the, the tax um, benefits for renewables, you know, it was, it was important to kind of kickstart the industry to have those subsidies. But our view is that it's, it's, it's achieved that. And right now, you know, we, us as an industry need to keep asking, need to stop asking for it. This last go around in Congress, we were, we were, you know, thinking about putting up a lobbying effort actually to say, no, thank you. We, we don't need it anymore because we think it does a disservice. And it's, it actually does a disservice in two areas, the way it's constructed right now for PTCs and ITCs. It, it distorts the cap structure of investing into the plants, and it distorts the power markets that these are involved in. And given that we really are at a place like the Lazard uh, chart shows the, the levelized cost of power to be able to do it without subsidies, we think the industry is better served to, to, to go forward that way. And you know, We're sanctioning our, our new battery deals with no no assumption on, on any sort of credits for that right now. And we, we think that introducing a part of the cap structure that would have to, you know, approve what we do to go forward is, it would be a hindrance, not a help to our, to our industry. Go ahead. P.O. is going to ask you a question, if that's okay. So um, we are trying to do a future transitions, and the, it, the world's always transitioning, right? It's just where it's going to go. Are you seeing any data in the Fed Energy Poll that Texas what we think of ourselves as an oil and gas state is really an energy state. And so are we seeing more activity in the, the, the gas space, but also in some of the clean tech space? Will, will Texas become the clean tech state as well as the oil and gas state? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we're also number one in wind. We're the nation's largest producer of wind power. Uh, I think when, and of course, I talked a little bit about the downstream. I mean, the downstream is huge. Uh, the petrochemical production, that whole, that whole sector. But in terms of energy generation, I think where, where it looks like from the data where we're lagging is in solar. So especially residential solar. So if you look at other states that are as sunny as Texas, they're way ahead of us on solar. And so we looked into this question. It was an interesting Texas-specific institutional thing, which looked like 
In other states like Colorado and California, you can sell, if you have residential solar panels, uh, you can sell any excess uh, electricity back to the utility. And that's mandated by state law. And we don't have that in Texas, uh, which we don't like a lot of regulations. But that actually, I think, would be useful to help people develop, you know, uh, install residential solar panels and, and uh, mitigate the cost. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, investment returns. So, uh, you know, one of the things I've been following is not as somebody, you know, I read about it, but I'm not as, as into it is all the debates about capital allocation and, and concerns that uh, capital has been spent on uh, production for production's sake or growth for growth's sake. Mm -hmm. um, so Eric, and, and whether it's in the spaces you see or, or Sean, can you talk a little bit about how, what you see in terms of capital allocations, return expectations, and where the industry is heading from a, from a uh, rationalizing investment perspective? Sure. Over the past 12 to 18 months, we have seen uh, the, the environment for producers, especially those that are pure play natural gas producers, really change, both from a pricing perspective, as you know, flat price in the U.S., if you look at Henry Hub NYMEX, or in-basin pricing is at or very close to all-time lows, so say, if you look at the 4 or 12 or 24-month strips. And also, uh, over the past, uh, call it year and a half, a uh, year, You've also seen a really big call for um, capital discipline amongst these producers. So I think about that specifically in terms of saying, hey, you need to show up with uh, a, you know, a, a demonstrable free cash flow yield at some point in time. So there's uh, it, it, those that are looking at, at price and just looking and observing the, the U.S. natural gas market right now, uh, as you look forward over the next few seasons, folks are really wondering, how is this going to ex uh, impact supply and demand? How much production decline could you really see from these um, gas-directed drillers going forward? So right now, um, it, the, if you look at public guidance from big producers in the Northeast, um, that's absolutely uh, something that's coming in terms of cutting CapEx and therefore cutting um, production guidance um, for 2020 versus 2019. Um, there's a bigger question mark for some of the, the private equity players that are really focused in the North Louisiana, East Texas area, but absolutely we're starting to see a change in behavior. It's just a big question mark as to what the actual magnitude of that uh, change will be on the market. Sean? Yeah, in terms of the, the quantum of capital that we see being deployed over the next 20 years, if you just take that chart that I think John showed, you know, the migration from renewables constituting about 18% of the, the generation stack today to maybe doubling over the next 20-year horizon to about 37%. By the way, Jim Robo, of the CEO of NextEra, the largest utility in the U.S., believes it happens by 2020, not 2040. But if you just look at that, the capital that's going to be required to build out that fleet, just that part, the renewables part of that migration, is, is in the order of about $25 billion a year of capital to be deployed. Um, that's a lot of investment dollars for us right now. And, you know, there's, that gets bifurcated into sort of two bits of risk bucket. There's the development of projects. And that needs to, to receive a, an appropriate rate of return or you don't take that risk. The markets are pretty efficient on that. And then there's once the projects get de-risked, they get built, they get proven out, and then there's a market for buying the de-risked built assets. So that has a very low rate of return. Renewables are very different than the thermal assets that I was used to developing and building in that the, the risk on the downside, since the, the, the marginal cost of generation is very low, you don't have that disconnect when we used to build gas turbines where we were worried about, you know, two commodities and what would happen to the spark spread or the heat rate, the efficiency of converting nat gas into electricity in two markets that could diverge. And with new gas turbines being efficient, you could wipe out the value of a gas turbine easily with a next-gen set of gas turbines. But with renewables, your bottom is actually pretty well centered because you're not counting on a different commodity for that. So they view that as a less risky investment. So it transact, recognizing that lower downside risk element for it. When you're buying an existing power plant that has a long-term offtake contract, these things will transact in the single digits, you know, the mid to high single digits. It's because they're kind of viewed as the, the risk-free up on a bonds basis. And of course, the development of these, you need to be compensated, you know, 15 to 20 percent north to do that. And so you see that in the capital markets. And it's, you know, I've watched this now for, for 30 years. The development business doesn't go away. Developers are out there to do this, and, and they, they capture a rent for the valuable service that they provide. Thanks. And, and 
Turning to source of uncertainty, Pia, you mentioned uh, you know, trade and, and some of that uh, issue role of Texas as exporters. Um, I'd like for maybe all of you to think, comment a little bit on as we head into an election year and, and looking back as well at all the debates and conversations around trade flows, how, how, how concerned should we be and how should we be thinking about international and, and trade issues uh, with your respects to the business? And uh, maybe Pia, do you want to start a little bit just thinking from the Fed's perspective on, on the role of trade in the energy business and what you, what you see? Uh, yes, I, I think we're very concerned, uh, and certainly our president, Rob Kaplan, is on the record. He's not shy about speaking up about the importance of international trade and what globalization has done for world growth and really reducing income inequality across countries. Um, so it's been very significant, and what we're seeing now, this trends towards deglobalization and increasing tariffs, um, is actually quite harmful on a number of levels. Uh, reduces consumer welfare because it increases prices. It reduces the competitiveness of our businesses because it protects them. Um, and so, but in the long run, of course, that makes them less competitive, less innovative, um, and so really lowers uh, progress and standards of living in the long run. And Eric, do you want to talk about the international outlook? Yes, uh, this is an issue that's clearly key, um, key in front and center stage for uh, Chenier and other LNG exporters. Um, Recently in the news, just last week, you saw some thawing in the, uh, the U.S.-China trade relations. Um, you saw a phase one deal, basically China coming out and saying that they were willing to buy about $200 billion worth of um, U.S. goods. About a fourth of those are, um, are hydrocarbons over the next two years. So while this is not a complete cessation of those tensions, of course, Chenier has been in contact with Chinese entities and, of course, always looking to sign a long-term supply deal. So that this, if anything, is, is good news on that front. But we absolutely need open borders to continue to export um, the LNG that the, the world might need. The way I think about this is that the U.S. is not too far away from being one of the top exporters of LNG in the world, and China is going to be one of the biggest markets, you know, full stop um, within the next, it already is one of the biggest markets, it's only going to continue growing going forward, so those two markets should, that supply and demand should absolutely match up going forward. And Sean, does this enter your conversations as, in, as investors? Well, absolutely. I mean, I might just say at the very beginning, I'm a free trader no matter what side of the book I'm on this, but because I just think the greater good is served. There's, so there's a cost sometimes for free trade, but I think on balance, the greater good is served by that. But yes, when we're, we're sanctioning a project and we're trying to bid into an RFP to buy panels two years out, and we don't know whether or not those panels are going to carry a tariff on it, yeah, heck yeah, we talk about it all the time, and we try to push it off on the, on the vendors sometimes. We're doing the same thing with battery cells right now. Can we get the battery cells manufacturers in China to take the risk if tariff goes up? Um, but it's, it's every time we, we sanction an asset, we have this issue right now. And are you thinking more, if, if bullish is optimistic about the future of trade, are you more bullish or bearish? I'm, I'm an optimist always. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I think that in, in the right answer comes out in the end always. Uh, yeah, me too. We, I was talking to Carlos a couple of months ago. We were talking about having a, a, he's been running a series of debates in front of students, and we talked about having a debate on free trade, and we couldn't find a professor to take the other side. Um, I mean, the, the, the problem is we're all trained um, in, in, the, in the data that have the supports the, the trade thesis. Um, so one of the things that Pia mentioned is the shortage of talent and labor and, and how that's affecting. And um, I, John, do you, can you give a perspective from what you see in student interest? Because uh, you've got you know, a spectrum of, of people in the room and, and up here on the stage. Uh, where do students seem to want to go, whether it's MBAs or undergraduates, and how are they thinking about uh, their, their, their futures coming out of our school? It's interesting. I, I would say that definitely the interest is leaning towards the cleaner side, right? That's where the, the interest amongst folks is, and I'll give you a couple data points. So we have an undergraduate minor in energy management, which is like the old PLM degree, but we opened it up to the entire campus. So, you know, we've got, what, 40,000 undergrads, Jay, on campus at, on the 40 acres. We have probably 30 or 40 students do that a year. Of those, 99% of them are from Houston, right? Because people from Houston understand business cycles, they understand the commodity cycle, they probably have family in the business, they're much more comfortable with it. We get a few Midlanders tossed in there too, but that's a smaller percentage. But that's, that's the makeup of the folks who want to get into oil and gas. They're from Houston and they've, they've ridden some cycles. Um, we teach a class uh, at the MBA level, which is a second year elective that Eric took and survived, he can attest. And Eric, do you remember how many female students were in your class when you took it? None. I believe it was none. Uh, we were 0 for 20 that year. This year we were 5 for 40. 
which was a record for us, right? So we have two issues. Number one, the numbers aren't super stellar, but getting female participants is even tougher. And let me contrast that with uh, Laura Starks, one of our most famous faculty members in finance, teaches a class in ESG investing to the MBAs. It's 60% women, right? And so those are the two big trends, is that we're having real trouble getting female students interested in pursuing careers in traditional energy, and we're having a little trouble getting anyone to pursue it. My thesis is that oil prices will cure a lot of that, right? Students will definitely uh, follow the economics, but right now, and that's part of what Carlos and I are trying to do, is I don't want to tell anybody what to do. I want them to make informed decisions. And so that's really what we're trying to do with these kind of events like this that we have for the students and other folks, where we just want to start that conversation. Thanks. Anybody else want to chime in on what they're seeing in labor markets? Pia, is it, is it going to get any looser? Or is it just going to be labor markets in, in Texas? Uh, no, I, we don't see that. No, because we have a little brighter outlook. We're still at record low unemployment rates, and we don't see these labor shortages alleviating anytime soon. All right, we've got a few more minutes left. I thought we'd open it up for, for questions. What do you all want to hear from the panel? And if you have cards, you can uh, hand it to one of our, our team members, or if you want to just ask something, uh, please fire away. And I can cold call Dan Carter as I'm looking at you. Uh, can you, can you go back and retroactively change people's grades if they don't participate? I can, look up the I can look up transcripts. I have all kinds of power I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, Alan, so this is more on the L&D side. So you've seen world prices collapse. So JKM's almost four bucks. And, and so what happens to U.S. gas? So there was a huge spread between U.S. gas prices and world prices. Now they've really come together where you really don't cover the cost of transport. So what does that do to U.S. gas exports? So, yeah, this is something that's I'm thinking about it every day as we watch this minute by minute. And uh, the way I've, I've been thinking about it is that the, you know, the global market has really loosened up since late 2018, as you've seen a lot of extra supply come online. A lot of that was from the U.S., um, actually, so part of the U.S. story. While growth, demand growth in Asia has decelerated. You saw some really big gains in China. Uh, over the preceding year or so before that, that period in uh, late 2018. But things have really loosened up, and that has only been exacerbated by the weather, right? Um, that's always the, the big exogenous concern in the gas market. It's weather, always weather. And um, so, therefore, as you've alluded to, price is low, and um, storage inventory is very high in Europe right now. Um, we believe that there's a, a longer-term path to to tighten up the market and for it to rebalance, just as you know, these are big projects in terms of building um, LNG uh, export terminals. So we we do see that there there will be a slowdown in supply ads over the next few years, while we see um, demand growth at a pretty steady clip, right? Basically on pace for LNG demand to basically double over the next two decades. But directly to your question about a potential impact on utilization of U.S. terminals, uh, we have not seen an impact thus far, and uh, are of course. In the, the market at large is looking forward over the next few seasons, especially this next summer, to see if you potentially could um, see some kind of impact. But again, we have not seen uh, anything at this point in time. And I think it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of uncertainty in the global market right now, which has actually spilled over into the U.S. market. And it's kind of what you saw um, it basically at the start of this past decade in the U.S., where we had all of this supply that showed up. And um, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. That's how you ended up with uh, so much coal versus gas competition in the stack, where you know, uh, you know, uh, gas is taking out of the, the total thermal dispatch almost 75% today. I think that the U.S. is exporting you know additional supply to the rest of the market, but it's also exported that market dynamic of figuring out what to do with all of this extra supply. So um, we will see how long it takes to. Uh, to, to you know, get, get out of this glut, but this next summer will be a big question of, of where the demand shows up and where these excess molecules could end up going. Eric, while well, I have you on stage, can you give me an, so what, I can, what can I tell my students is that transportation cost? So when I look at Henry Hub, and then I think about adding transportation costs to it, that should be about the market equilibrium price, I would think in my head, but what is that cost today? Uh, so to Europe, which called a two week trip or so, you know, buck fifty to two ish dollars. Okay, and that includes the liquefaction and stuff or so that would be what you would apply to the, the raw commodity spread. That, that's what shipping is. Perfect. Thanks. As a, as a follow up a question I got from the crowd is um, Eric or anybody else brave enough, what's a five year outlook look for, for prices? 
Uh, on the record. Five years from now, we'll bring you back and see how you did. An easy one. But uh, I can speak in a lot of detail towards the U.S. outlook, and unfortunately, there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, I mentioned weather. There's a lot of weather between uh, now and then. So uh, the, it's really a, 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 a very, fortunately for exporters, a rather bearish backdrop currently because the U.S. saw record year-over-year -year production growth uh, in 2018 and something that was pretty close to record production growth in 2019 as well. So that led to just a very, very loose market. Um, we're just now starting to tighten back up as more export terminals have come online and production growth has begun uh, to slow. Now that has led, that's been that, that bearish backdrop and then we've gotten bearish weather on top of that. I was looking uh, yesterday and this past January, if you, if you basically population weight temperatures across the U.S., this is going to be a top five warmest uh, month on record, going back to 1950. So um, the outlook is, is for continued low prices uh, in, um, in natural gas in the U.S., and I think that really speaks to just the size of the resource base. There was a lot of noise made before uh, a lot of these export terminals came online that they would really raise prices going forward. Well, we're exporting almost 10 percent of what we're producing today via LNG tankers, yet we're at but by a lot of measures, all-time lows in price. So I do think it is safe to say that um, that you know you will continue to see low prices and hopefully you know low enough to, to maintain that that R between here, Europe, or here in Asia. Thanks. I've got two related questions, uh, both about nuclear. So one of the things we don't hear a lot of talk about is nuclear. And so one question is why not? Uh, why not more nuclear? Second question is it it pertains to the outlook for uh, nuclear investment. Sean, you want to talk about nuclear? It's nearly impossible, and it's regulatory driven. It's just, it's too expensive to build, not because the physical plant is, ex you know, well, it's not competitive right now anyway, but you add on the cost to build one from getting through the nuclear regulatory agencies globally and then in the U.S., that makes it just cost prohibitive, just the regulatory friction cost associated with doing a nuke. So they're, they're in a tough market. Right now, Indian Point 1, 2, and 3 in New York are shutting down. Uh, we backed a company who was trying to save Fitzpatrick before, um, Jay Warren Klein, who's been in the industry for 40 years. It's, um, it's tough. Um, it's the nuclear people, even when you have an existing plant, are asking the regulators for handouts to stay online. It's expensive. <laughs> yep. Jay, can I add one thing? Yeah, please. An interesting sidebar to that is, even if we went full bore and decided to think about going nuclear, we, we may not have the expertise to do it very quickly, right? Because we've stopped educating people in those fields. So there's all these d different interactions. This is always a risky joke to try to tell because I don't have a French accent, but we did an event of why French is like Texas, and we had the French uh, <laughs> energy minister on video, and he said this thing, and it took a while for it to sink in, but he said, the problem in the United States that I see is that in France, We've chosen one type of nuclear power plant and many types of cheese. Well, in America, you've done the exact opposite, right? And so we haven't picked one to get good at, right? And so there's just this problem, right, that we, we, we just haven't really focused is what I'd say. Because I think nuclear has great potential. If you're worried about low carbon fuels, it makes a ton of sense. Expensive, time delays, regulatory, and now this issue of workforce. So this is like your solar, back. your old solar joke. Right now. <laughs> yeah, that's when right. When is nuclear going to work again? That's right. What else? Please, back, back row. Okay. Everybody hear the question? So the question is, if, if administrative uh, administration flips, get an anti-fracking regime in, uh, what happens? Ann Arbor looks better. <laughs> we don't see any imminent threat on, on that front, on the supply or the demand side, but of course, um, any, anything that would inhibit the, the, uh, the production or the, the export of this huge resource base in the U.S. would be um, quite detrimental to business activity in Texas, across the U.S. Um, so that's something that we do not see on the horizon, be it you know, um, in curtailing fracking activity or taking a second look at export licenses or any huge resistance to that, but that's my stance. So Sean, from an investment firm, are you all, do you underwrite political scenarios, changes, risk? We, 
we react to whatever the, the market is. Whatever the cards are on the table, we invest according to the, the cards that are on the table. You know, I can't speak for my brethren that are on the, the upstream investing side, but nature finds a way. You know, if, there, if, if there's a new rule in the market, well, then we're smart investors. We'll invest in, to make money in, in that environment, no matter how the deck gets done. Same, same on the renewable side of our house. You know, if the rules change, there will always be some way to make money. You just got to learn what the new rules are. Thanks. Please. Hi, good morning. Um, so my question is, so I work for a manufacturing organization that builds HVAC, which is a big suck of energy. Um, we are uh, at risk here, vulnerable to climate change, and the organization that the uh, parent is Osaka Japan, which they are also very subject to climate change. So, you know, we have technologies that are more and more efficient um, that we're developing here in the United States. And my question to you is, you know, just like solar, solar took a while for the economics to get in, is it policy, is it economics, or is it more the awareness of what we're doing to the climate that would change the behavior of the consumer? I'll take a little bit of that. Uh, I'd say there's an all of the above on some of that. Um, you know, there is a migration for the voters at the ballot box, the consumers at the cash register, and investors that look at climate awareness in degrees, right? So there's not one voter, one consumer, one investor, but what we're witnessing right now is a trend line on that. So there are 37 states in the US that have what are called renewable port portfolio standards. And that just means that you set a minimum, so let's say 50% of your power generation has to come from a carbon-free basis. Well, that's really done at the voter ballot box. You know, you can vote the bums out if you don't like that, right? Um, when you look at the consumers, you know, when you see there's just something called the the RE100. It's these large corporations who've signed up to go carbon-free by a self-imposed sunset date. You know, they'll put a date in the future, and then you'll, you'll read these announcements that AT&T signed an, a, a wind contract. This company signed a solar contract. Google, Facebook, all these other companies. But what really kind of woke me up was when Walmart, and which is the largest renewable power buyer of corporates in the U.S., and then Budweiser. You know, this is... This is not a bolder beer. This is, this, is the, this is the beer of tractor pulls. When they decided that they needed to put the wind turbines on their, their beer can, it's Madison Avenue saying, I'm pandering to my, my, my clients. So there's a trend across this. When you look at just the broader global capital markets of limited partners, Morningstar have said that 70, no, 85% now of global investors have some degree of interest in looking at sustainable investing. That's risen from 71% just in 2015. So you see just that as a trend. That doesn't mean that, that everyone's joined the divest invest movement. No, that's a fringe part of it. But there are people that are becoming more aware. The, the number of funds or the amount of money that's gone into sort of just pure ESG investments quadrupled from last year to, to 2019, 18 to 19. So that's just an observable trend line. And when you look at the, the younger people, they pulled even higher. So, you know, as this moves up, you're kind of seeing something. So at least in our investing horizon, we think that that's uh, something that's, that the inertia is going that direction right now. John? And it, the place where I think consumers are likely to see it first is in insurance costs. So we were talking, we, um, at the last little plug, KBL Hutchinson Center for Energy Law and Business Energy Symposium in the fall, you should be there, it's great. We had a guy from McKinsey who talked about what's going to happen in the insurance markets in sort of places like Miami where that's going to be maybe the first signal that a lot of consumers get. The other signal that we're trying to give them is um, when I talk to my undergrads about ESG investing and things like that, I'll ask them a question, which is, um, did Budweiser do that to raise their returns, or did Budweiser do that because they had enough returns that they could give up something for an ESG event, right? Sort of what's the arrow of causality? And then I'll ask them, like when I was a kid in undergrad, I was thinking of an 8% return for life. 
if they were thinking eight, but now they're going to get four because we're investing in other kinds of returns, are they willing to work an extra 15 years? Right? And so those kind of discussions are the things that, again, I just want them coming in eyes wide open, but I think there will be some signals to the extent that the market starts to price these things, and I suspect insurance may be one of the first ones. Up here, last final question. No, no pressure. Thank you. Um, so this is a price-related question as to crude, maybe for Sean. If shale production is a good part of the swing production, and currently there's a very little or restricted capital funding E&P space, and shale wells have a much steeper decline curve than conventional wells, longer term does that put a floor under the price deck? Well, that's what a lot of people have said, right? Oh. Uh, um, and you know, I'm, I, I don't. I'm not an expert on where crude economics or drilling economics or gas economics. Um, but in the mid '80s, when I was being interviewed to go to Vincent Elkins, one guy kept me out overnight in 1984 till about 1 a.m. in a parking lot at a recruiting event, asking me, "Do energy prices in the future go to zero?" <laughs> I don't. Uh, you know, that was a futurist sort of view. But I think that, no, I argued, no, it never goes to zero, but it, it, there is a, you know, a lowering of cost of, of energy over time. But, you know, people have to make money or they stop doing stuff, except for airlines. But every other industry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, please join me in thanking all of our panelists. Thank you all for coming out. We'll see you next year.